One month after millions of Texans baked in the post-hurricane heat for days, Centerpoint Energy's discussions with the governor are underscored by a sense of uneasiness. This is unacceptable and it will change. Experts pinpoint the problem as the brunt of hurricane season looms. I have to make a judgment like which one of these people is most likely to be killed or seriously injured in the next 24 hours if I don't file a domestic violence protective order for them. New rules could give low-income Texans more access to legal aid, the change that could be around the corner now that the Texas Supreme Court took action. A new program launched in New Mexico is inviting healthcare workers to leave the Lone Star State. The money behind filling a need in our neighboring state and the politics around the attempt. Produced from the Capitol in Austin and airing statewide, this is the award-winning State of Texas. Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Josh Hinkle. Accountability over the shooting at Robb Elementary became big news this week. On Friday, the lawyer for former Uvalde CISD police chief Pete Adedondo talked about his charges from the mass shooting at Robb Elementary. He is facing 10 counts of abandoning and endangering a child. Prosecutors say Adedondo's decision slowed the law enforcement response to stop the shooter. His lawyer claimed the chief's decisions prevented more deaths that day, and he calls the charges against him improper. The lack of the command post caused best guess decisions on inadequate information. That is not criminal. When a police officer makes their best possible decision based on the information they've got, it may or may not be right but it's not criminal. A former school police officer also faces the same charges. The indictments for Arredondo and former officer Adrian Gonzalez are the first charges since the deadly shooting at Robb Elementary two years ago. Both men pleaded not guilty. The Texas Department of Public Safety has reinstated a Texas Ranger who was suspended for more than a year over his response to the Robb Elementary school shooting in Uvalde. This after previous plans to fire him. You may remember 19 children and two teachers died and nearly 400 officers took more than an hour to take down the gunman. Ranger Ryan Kendall was suspended in January 2023, accused of not doing his duty. Joining us to give us insight is our Monica Madden. Thank you for being here. Of course, thanks for having me. So can you take us back to the initial reason behind the suspension and why Ranger Kendall is returning now? So you might remember back when we first started seeing some of the investigations open into police officers actions that day. There were 91 officials from the Department of Public Safety. Texas Rangers falls under that branch. Initially, Kendall was one of the seven DPS employees who was under investigation for actions that day. And ultimately, Director Stephen McCraw of the Department of Public Safety decided that Ranger Kendall did not do his part that day. That was his um, assumption based on all the facts and decided to terminate him. But it was pending everything else that we've been waiting on. Of course, the completion of the Texas Ranger investigation as well as um, whatever the district attorney of Uvalde was going to find that was pending for more than a year and we are now at the point where Kendall is back he's reinstated because of the grand jury's findings that he did not do anything wrong according to um, all of the evidence that they have reviewed you spent months investigating Kendall's actions in 2023 what did you find then and how does it compare to uh, what we saw with the grand jury my colleague investigator Dalton Huey and I were able to obtain internal documents from the Texas Rangers and the Department of Public Safety that showed incredibly detailed information about Ranger Kendall's actions that day. Uh, things like call logs, who he spoke to, when he did what, um, and everything that we saw um, according to his officials, the top the head of the Texas Rangers and the assistant there, they both thought that Ranger Kendall followed protocol perfectly. McCraw disagreed with that. So that obviously was dragged out for a long period of time, but the grand jury's findings um, matched up with what the head of the Texas Rangers found, and it was that he followed the protocol that he was supposed to do that day. Have you heard from the families in Uvalde about this latest development? Yeah, um, Brett Cross, his son Uzziah was one of the victims that day, and Brett took online to Twitter um, or now known as, known as X, just to express his frustration. He basically said that he was upset that this is the, one of the few people who was actually facing disciplinary action and was let go, saying, quote, Kendall was the only one who was, quote, disciplined. And I say that loosely because he was given a two-year paid vacation as Kendall was 
was um, suspended with pay. Um, so for the families, at the end of the day, the intricacies of police disciplinary action, you know, what standards are they being held to when considering whether they'll face consequences? It's a moot point to these families who lost everything and see a situation where there were 400, 376 exact um, law enforcement officials who collectively waited 77 minutes before going into the classroom, taking down the gunmen and saving survivors. So for these families at the end of the day, all of this, they just wanna see someone take the fall for all of the failures that happened that day, Josh. All right, Monica, thank you for your coverage. Thank you. A month after Hurricane Barrel, Harris County is still recovering. More than 2 million Centerpoint Energy customers lost power. Some went weeks without electricity. The company has a little over three weeks until it has to come up with proposed changes to prevent similar problems the next time a storm hits. That's a deadline Governor Greg Abbott set. Ed Hers, an energy fellow at the University of Houston, says the problem is easy to pinpoint. This was a deliberate strategic decision by Centerpoint to cut back on the maintenance of the lines, to cut back on the removal of vegetation. And this was reported to the Public Utility Commission in Centerpoint's filings for the last five years. Centerpoint announced its new Greater Houston Resiliency Initiative on Monday. According to a press release from Centerpoint, the initiative reflects direct feedback from Governor Abbott and includes over 40 actions the energy company will take to meet Abbott's requirements on an accelerated timeline. This week, a federal appeals court heard arguments from attorneys in the long-standing lawsuit over foster care in Texas, including a request to remove the judge who has overseen the case for the last 13 years. Cake Sands Avery Travis has been following this case and joins us now with more. Josh, this case has really been marked by some tense interactions at some points between U.S. District Judge Janice Jack and leaders of the state's child welfare agencies. Now, attorneys representing the state have asked the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals to remove Judge Jack from the case. They argue that her, quote, passion and conviction have clouded her ability to be fair and impartial. Meanwhile, an attorney representing the foster children in this case argued in support of Judge Jack. He says that she wants nothing more than a safe system for these children and for the state to comply with her court-ordered reforms. Well, give us some background on those court-ordered reforms. What are they and has the state made any progress on them? I want to take us back to 2015. That's when Judge Jack ruled that kids were actually leaving Texas foster care system more damaged than when they entered the state's care. At the time, she issued dozens of court-ordered reforms to try and improve the system. Since then, the judge has actually held the state in contempt of court for failing to follow these orders several times, and that includes her most recent ruling, which ordered the state to pay some hefty daily fines for failing to properly investigate certain claims of abuse and neglect of children in the system. Now, the state almost immediately pushed back, basically arguing that this order focused on a small group of investigations overseen by an agency called the Health and Human Services Commission. And they argued that it ignored some major progress by another agency, the Department of Family and Protective Services. Now, even the lawyers for the children in this case have recognized that the state has made progress, but they told the Fifth Circuit they believe one agency's progress shouldn't negate failures from another agency. Did the Fifth Circuit give any indication on what they might do now? Keep in mind, the appeals court actually already temporarily put a halt or a hold on those daily fines for the state. And during this most recent hearing, they really heavily questioned the attorney for the kids. Uh, some of those questions focused on comments that the judge has made in past hearings. Also for more context, after Judge Jack's original 2015 ruling, the Fifth Circuit upheld some parts of her ruling. They agreed with her, but they didn't agree with all of the reforms that she laid out. So there's some historical context there, but we'll of course update you as soon as we hear any decision or ruling from the Fifth Circuit on this particular hearing. All right, Avery, thank you very much. Closing the justice gap. There are not enough lawyers in Texas. That's why the state Supreme Court announced this week new preliminary rules to let some people provide legal services traditionally limited to licensed attorneys. Ryan Chandler tells us why it's needed. The phrase is justice for all, not for hire. 
But in Texas, the state's highest civil court worries the right to seek fair justice is a privilege, not a right. The justice gap hurts the integrity of the justice system. According to the Legal Services Corporation, 92% of low-income Americans have unmet legal needs. Simple, everyday legal issues can prove daunting for those who can't afford or find a lawyer. We need to make some structural changes in the way the legal profession operates to help close that justice gap and be sure that low-income Texans have access to quality, civil, basic legal services. Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid reports 67 Texas counties have just five lawyers or fewer. Now the Supreme Court is moving to empower paralegals and court access assistants to step in. It kind of reminds me of the debate over uh, allowing registered nurses to do uh, basic medical care. Maybe they can't perform surgery, but they can do the basic things that a patient may need. Same, same kind of idea there. Absolutely. And we've seen, you know, great success in the medical profession and, and we've taken note of that. And just like in medicine, some legal problems can be life and death. Domestic violence work, for example, often it's like an ER a triage system where they have to decide, like, I have so many people asking me for these protective orders that can't afford a lawyer, and I have to make a judgment, like, which one of these people is most likely to be killed or seriously injured in the next 24 hours if I don't file a domestic violence protective order for them? And sometimes you guess wrong. The new rules are open for public comment through November 1st and expected to go into effect on December 1st. Ryan Chandler, State of Texas. We're just super glad that our story is being used as sort of a catalyst to, you know. How things should be yeah. and um, that no one else would, you know, would have to go through what we're going through. Preventing disaster. Newly released surveillance video shows how a fatal crash into an Austin emergency room unfolded. Leaders say it further supports their push for safety. New Mexico leaders are sending out an invite to our doctors and nurses, the campaign targeting Texas healthcare workers to leave the state.